Hello there, ladies and gentlemen. Are you ready to rock? You are off stage with DWP and one of the biggest bands we've, we've been dealing with since the inception of DWP. I have the front man lead singer Brent Smith of Shinedown with us today on Offstage. Brent, What's happening, handsome? Trying, man. You know, uh, in, in different circumstances, I wish I could, we could be walking backstage. I, I could, uh, you know, bum rush your, your, your bus or, 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 or your big uh, backstage production room and give you a proper hug. Um, we are uh, off, offline. We were talking about hugging and sorry, we're just going to have to do that in the near future. It's going to happen. Yes, sir. Um, Shinedown is, 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 is family to DWP. Um, but I, I want to take it, I want to take it back to the start because, um, I don't know if you're aware of this, but, uh, the first time we asked you out on a date, you said no. And I'll, and I'll explain. Um, Actually, the, the, I'll, I'll even go back further. Danny Wimmer, Danny and I um, were both at record labels, and Danny was, I think, at Flawless, and got a demo from Steve-O, a good friend of mine when I was at Atlantic Records back, uh, back in the early, uh, late 90s, early 2000s for me. Steve Robertson. Yes, sir. Um, and it had the song 45 on it. And as Wimmer explains, he just flipped out, and no pun intended. And he's like, I, I have to have him. I have to have him. I think he even offered Steve-O a full-time job in order to bring, for the sole purpose of bringing Shinedown over to, to his label. Uh, it didn't happen. You ended up obviously signing with Atlantic and having a, a great experience with them. Um, and then the second time uh, that was said no to us, we were starting a little festival called Rock on the Range in Columbus, Ohio. And from the get-go, Bill McGaffey, who's a dear friend to us and uh, your manager and yep. soul, soul brother on the front lines of rock and roll with us. Um, 100%. We were starting rock on the range. He had a couple bands and the one we wanted was shine down. And he was like, Gary, I can't give you them. This was late 2006, early 2007. You guys were yeah. writing songs for sound of madness. Yeah. Then. Um, so we launched rock on the range. The one band we really wanted, we couldn't get, which obviously, as you know, in life, makes you want them more. Um, got you the next year. Uh, for all you guys who are listening, Sound of Madness, which included you know, Second Chance and obviously the title track, Sound of Madness. Um, and then our relationship just really took off from there. So uh, do you remember 2008, the first time Shinedown played Rock on the Range? I do. I remember it was a little bit earlier in the afternoon. Um, I remember at that point in time, I think we, we definitely had already been out. So we were kind of, we were a bit seasoned in regards to, um, it's pretty new um, with the touring cycle at that point in time. But yeah, I remember that day because I just remember the very first time that outside of a festival, like with an open field, where sometimes it's just, you know, there's a lot of people and it seems like it stretches you know, for miles and miles. I remember it was the first time that I'd ever been in a, in a stadium environment. And it was early in the day, but it was, it was packed. I mean, it was, I think we went on at like 4.30, 5 in the afternoon, something like that. Um, and first time I'd ever seen a festival, well, handled extremely well. You've always been very professional. Um, you and Danny both, of all the years that I've known you, you put the audience first, you put the safety of the audience first, and you wanna make sure that everybody has an amazing, wonderful, enjoyable time. But you know, you guys put the work in and make it interesting. And it's not just about like the, the audience showing up and like they just watch a show. You always have all these really, really cool events that are going on around people, really getting people socially, you know, connected and finding one another. Um, I just remember just a massive amount of just camaraderie. It was a really positive day. Do you, um, you could be honest, do you prefer a shine down headline show or a festival where maybe you're not the headliner, but you're one of the, the, the top acts on the bill? That's question one. And then question two is, do you approach them the same? I've always said that um, it doesn't matter if there's one or 100,000 people in the audience because we played for both. Um, <laughs> and 
I think that as far as the preference between a headlining Shinedown show versus a festival, whether it's in the U.S. or whether it's internationally or abroad and what have you, um, is there a difference between those two? Yeah, I guess you would say fundamentally there's a difference, but where I want to play is where everyone shows up. You know what I mean? Like, yes. it's funny, I've said this before. I'm like, I want to play the desert and have everyone show up. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> where it's just, which basically to that analogy, it means there's no, there's no cap. It, right. it can be just, just a mass of people being inspired by one another and creating memories. And, you know, a very wise man, one of my favorite quotes of any philosopher came from a gentleman by the name of Frederick Nietzsche. And he said, without music, life would be a mistake. And I, I tend to agree with that. So in answer to the question, I just really prefer where everybody shows up. I love festivals because you get to see friends that you haven't seen in a while and you get to, you know, catch up with everybody. And I also just love the, the competition because for the most part, there's a healthy competition that happens during festivals, especially in the summertime, because you see bands that either you've been on tour with before um, that you've not seen in a while, but there is usually, especially in rock and roll, there's usually, because rock and roll is not just a genre of music, it's a way of life for people. And, um, you know, with that being said, there's a healthy competition that happens because your buds and, you know, male and female that you're hanging out with, you know, backstage or in catering, you're catching up and what have you. But when it's your set time, no matter what time of the day it is, you know, there's that switch that goes off when it's your time to get on stage. And I love how it's with everybody. It's usually, hey, when I get up there, I'm coming for your ass. You know what I mean? But, that, but that's good. That's healthy. You know what I mean? It totally. gets everybody on their A game. Well, you, you, you reminded me of two things. One, we take great, great pride at, at DWP. By the way, you're, you're off stage with DWP. We have Brent Smith of Shinedown with us. Um, we take great pride in, in, in what we call stacking the deck, where we want to give quality and quantity to, to the rock fan at our festivals. Absolutely. And we, whether it's Rock on the Range or Louder Than Life or Sonic Temple or Aftershock, there's festivals at two o'clock, 70 to 80% of our door is in there. So bands know that too. So our fans and the people who come to our festivals, again, we take great pride in that, that, that they bring it. And th which brings me to, to point B, just like you said, I've talked to a couple of your peers about this. Yeah, I, I love the attitude that you guys have that it is kind of like, you know, like a football game or a boxing match. Yeah. Like, I love you, brother but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to wax you on that stage. Sorry. <laughs> and that's yeah. healthy. It is. Because yeah. there's no, here's the thing about that. There's no malice behind that. Are you sure? It's us as, <laughs> it's us as individuals keeping the other one accountable to always bring your A game because the audience deserves that. The audience yeah. deserves your 100% absolute best. Yes, sir. Um, I want to get in. I might surprise you here um, because we, we have, you and I have talked in the past. And one thing that surprised me, and I was so pleasantly surprised, um, I think I just asked you one of those generic questions while we were hanging out, was, hey, who influenced you? And your answer was, was again, pleasantly surprising. And you talked about how Motown singers yes. influence you. And there's so many, again, of, of, your, of your peers, of, of bands uh, at your level or lower, that will never say that, you know? Um, I, and in, in one, the one bet song that got me, that really said, okay, Shine Down to me is on a different level, was from your first album, Fly From The Inside. And the reason why I bring that up is, I don't know if anybody's really gone under the hood of that song, but there's some fantastic vocal harmonies in that song. Thank you. Yeah, and I, I don't know if that's ever really truly been brought up. I, I, I encourage everybody to go back to that song and listen to the pre-chorus and the chorus. I'd love to like, take, if you can take us back to the studio of that. Number one, how many vocal tracks were there, if you remember? Because I know this, it's like, uh, what, 18 years ago? Well, yeah. Um, I remember everything started with the dynamic that when I was writing with a lot of different songwriters and then we would do a demo, a lot of times what would happen is 
because it's a demo, it, which just means a demonstration. You know, you would only do maybe just one vocal just to kind of get the song, you know, uh, presented in a way that you could play it for someone. And then the thought process of that was when we take it into the studio with a real producer, that we will enhance that. And certain people in the industry could see past just a demo that maybe was just an acoustic guitar and one vocal. And that was something very, very early on that without me having any experience, what I actually wanted to do was, I don't want to be like everyone else in regards to doing demos. So long story short, what I started to do was, I started to basically, when we would write songs or when I was a part of writing a song and what have you, um, we looked at the demo as the record and said, well, if we're going to do it, then let's do it. Let's take the time to not have to make the listener envision other parts and things like that, like present it the way you want it to be heard. Yeah. And so that took on a different life for me um, because I then started to learn how to double my voice. Um, before Pro Tools was like they had vocal line and things like that. And then obviously with you know cutting and pasting and kind of taking the human side out of everything, Yes. Um, because even at 42 years of age with six albums and continuing on, being on a record label as illustrious as, as Atlantic Records, having six records, and then in 2017, signing a deal for two more albums, um, you know, because the original contract we had, you know, uh, it was a six album deal. We have six albums. And before Attention Attention was even turned in, the last album, they asked us to if we would resign for two more records. And we said, obviously, absolutely. Yeah. Um, I'm going to get to your, get to your point though. Um, <laughs> I think in all there was from the main core of the vocals on fly, uh, the lead was consistent in the verses of two doubles. Um, and then the ah bed that comes yeah. in, in the pre-chorus. I love we the ah bed. Those we stack those four ways, but we stack three part harmony. So you have to add four and then eight, nine, 10, 11, 12. You start stacking that because, you know, money is, a, is, you know, you only have a little bit of money on your first album. <laughs> so like you don't have enough money for an entire choir. So I have to become a choir. So you start stacking right. those vocals, but you're not stacking the same uh, melody on everything. And when you start to stack the harmonies, if you want that sound, you have to, you have to do a lot of multi-tracking. I think yes. there's all together on that particular song, I think with all the harmonies and all the beds, there's about 60 vocal tracks. 60, how about that? Yeah. Don't, right be about alarmed. that. Hey, don't be alarmed, everybody. John Lennon double-tracked his voice. Kurt Cobain double-tracked. I think what you mean by double-track is you, were, you literally would sing the lead, you would sing it twice. Right, so they went, how they I usually went, yeah. would do it, how I usually do it is like once the song is written, so that I can be, so I can get kind of laser focused. And by the way, back in the day, 18 years ago, they didn't have the technology that they have now to basically take a vocal and really manipulate it. Right. And then ultimately you can just sing, say you've got a verse. So you sing it 10 times and then you comp that vocal with all the different takes you get the lead in one and then you go back in and you sing to it a few more times and then they just put it all together and they'll do it with computer magic i still to this day do not do it like that that's how what i'm I talking have, about yeah, yeah how i have to do it is i have to be able to emote the passion to the song that's a lot of the reasons why it's really important for me when a song is written once i go in we and we definitely now we don't do demos anymore like when we write a song we walk in and we make it record ready so initially you're not going to get me a month later and having the same inflection as that that moment in time when the song's been just written and you have all that that excitement and you have all that passion and you have all that, um, that gusto, if you will. Right. And <clears throat> that's why once the songs are written, it's really, really important as a singer 
that you know your voice and you know what you're going to do and you trust the people that you work with in the studio that you are getting the most honest and powerful performance that you can but do not this is just my opinion do not rely on the computer well like, jewel, uh, jewel once said uh, the recording artist jewel recording a vocal is like faking an orgasm sometimes that's pretty rad right I, like that. I, I, I right because you kind of what you're giving to the world is what they're going to hear on the radio over and over. And it's got to be, and I want to get to, to, to this thought later, but, and also I'll just pause that. But the fact that you said, you know, I just love the fact that you, that you said that a computer could probably fix you or I could go in or who knows a fan could, could go in and be a minute It's pretty limitless. Right? Yeah. And there, that's not rock and roll. Rock and roll should be about the fuck up, right? It should be about spacing. And, right. you know, I it think should be what, human. Yes. Right. You know, that's right. And yes. that's the other thing too, even in, in, in recording today, um, the tonality of our actual ears have changed in the last 10 year. And especially if you're generation Z and even some millennials, you're not inept to the tone of analog. So you, you've been, um, you're, your tonality is built inside of digital. Now, di digital has come a long, long way. And obviously, with technology and plugins and what have you, there's simulators for tape and things like that that like warm up, you know, the recordings. But you have to be mindful of that because the digital side of things, if you're not careful, it will take the human feel out of things. So like in Shinedown, we don't we don't beat detective anything. We try not to quantize anything. We try to, even if, it, now it has to be on a click so that your meter stays, you know, yes. in the zone, right. especially for the drummer. Um, but, you know, Barry needs to also, our drummer, Barry Kirch, he also needs to be able to lay in and kind of be ahead of the beat sometimes, and, you know, in front sometimes, and then sometimes he needs to lay back. So you don't want to go in there and when a drummer has just done a very powerful, passionate drum track for your song, you don't want an engineer to come in there and like make it perfect to the grid. Cause then it just sounds like a robot. You might as well just have a drum machine do it. Right. You know what I mean? So there's ways of, and that just takes experience. It really does. Like you don't want to lose the human feel on a recording. And if you're not careful, um, that can happen. And then you just start sounding like what we call band in a can. Yeah. And you don't want that. You want to yeah. have a sound. You want to have, you know, who you are. We didn't really find our sound as Shinedown until, in my personal opinion, until Sound of Madness. That was the album that we finally start to, we, we started to tap in to what and who we really were. I have to give a lot of credit to Rob Cavallo for that because he was the producer of that record. Um, and also Dave Bassett, who was one of the main songwriters on that album with myself. Um, he was instrumental in that as well. Well, I wanted to get under the hood of a Shinedown okay. song and I think we did it. So, you know, sorry everybody, but I, I, I hope people got some good stuff out of that, mostly that Rock and roll should be about, should be human. It shouldn't be computerized. Yeah. It should be real. And the um, other side of that too, with the songwriting aspect, you write a hundred songs, you hope you wrote 10 really, really good ones, and you pray you wrote one that's just phenomenal, and then you write a hundred more. Right on. You just, well, there's, there's no end to it. You just, you, you have to keep, you know, practicing and, uh, in order to be well at your craft, you know, what do they say? To be a master, it takes 10,000 hours. And then uh, find something else that you can master. <laughs> <laughs> Shit. And I've got a, I got a Hollywood writer, screen, screenwriter friend who said it's not about the write, it's about the rewrite. There you go. Right? Yeah. So just good point. It's also oh, a yeah. good, good analogy there, too, just in regards to music and the way that we look at things, especially when it comes to art. It's, uh, it's not about the painter. It's about the painting. Nice. There's one more thing on songwriting that, that you do, and correct me if I'm wrong, you, you and I use, I use fly again, because you have kind of the, an intro line, which is, here's the weight of the world on my shoulders. Yeah. And you, you seem to have a theme of like a, it's almost like a brand, it's almost like a riff, like a guitar riff, your intro lines, and I, I use in the song Devil, 
you have to pick up the pick up the pick up the pick up the phone and then the song takes like begins right is that is that a conscious thing that you're it, this the kind of this intro line that you seem to do that i don't know who else does that um i think that it's probably subconscious um for that particular song devil um we were just at the beginning stages of kind of because Devil was written in the middle of the writing process for Attention, Attention, okay. before we realized that it was going to be a conceptual piece because the whole album is a story. Um, but I was always taught, because I have some massively just amazing songwriting teachers that I've been lucky enough to be in the same room with for the last 20 years. And I'm consistently able to go in these rooms with different people that are just amazing songwriters and have you know they would say that i've taught them things and you know but they've taught me things that's why it's a give and uh i don't like to say give and take it's more give and give you know right. you're always learning from one another but i was always told you know you don't want to think that you have a song where the chorus is awesome the pre-chorus is okay and the verses are just whatever you need to do there because we got to get to the <laughs> chorus well, you're not going to be able to get to the chorus within the 15 seconds and you've bored everyone or it's not compelling or it doesn't sound like it doesn't draw you in. You know what I mean? So those 15 seconds, the beginning of a song, no matter what it is, no matter what style it is, that first 15 seconds is extremely important. It's actually very crucial to decide whether or not they're going to keep listening. Yeah, I, I, you, Shinedown, seems to take a real priority in that, yeah, there's so many rock songs that kind of start off, you know, maybe with guitar and drums and they build up, but yeah, you kind of, you kind of burn from, from second one. Yeah. On, on try to anyway. Yeah. Try to make it compelling. And I'm also the type of person, you've known me a long time. We've talked about this before. You know, I, I know people and it's just their character and there's nothing wrong with it. But the question of like, you know, when you're driving down the road, wherever you are in the world or, or what have you, and you hear your song on the radio, what do you do? Well, most people are like, oh, I, I turn it off. And I don't want to hear myself. And I'm the opposite. I turn it up. You know what I mean? Because I'm, I'm proud of it. Like, I wouldn't have written it. and I wouldn't have put my voice on it if I didn't want the world to hear it. But I also try to write music that I like to listen to. You know, I try to write the songs that I would want to hear. Well, um, we're off stage. With DWP, I got Brent Smith at Shinedown. I got one more question. It's a pretty decent segue. Not a, not a perfect one, but I'm going to try. That's all good. You, you've, tied, you've kind of, um, Shinedown has adopted a song, and it's so hard when, it, when there's an iconic song. that and, and, But I feel like Shinedown's made it their own, which is Simple Man, you know, by, by Skinnerd. And yep. I, Wimmer, Danny Wimmer and I will get into arguments on what was the loudest sing-along at a DWP festival in the history of DWP festivals? And my answer is Shine Down Simple Man at Aftershock in 2019, okay. which was a sold no, out, 40,000 people. Um, it was just, it's goosebumps, you know? Um, I, I, just gotta, I just gotta ask you on Simple Man. Thank you, by the song. way, for letting us play that show because it was very historical and we know it was, especially for Sacramento. So thank you, as always, for letting us be a part of those moments. Yeah, absolutely. Your family. I mean, it's shine, again, Shinedown has so many. I, there's so many memories I have. Um, I actually have one in the rain in Columbus, Ohio. And then after the show, uh, we were backstage and I introduced you to Michael Lang, uh, the creator oh, yeah. of Woodstock. And of course, yeah. it was raining because he was there because he just brings the rain. Um, a wonderful hit. I, I totally remember that moment in time. I was the, I was the first and only time I've, I, by the way, everybody, uh, ladies and gentlemen, I saw Brent Smith ask for a photograph of somebody else. Yeah. And that, that was from well, Link. But kind that, of a big deal. <laughs> yeah, yeah, totally. But back to Simple Man. Um, does that song just kind of have a new meaning to you? You know, it, it's one of those songs that for me personally, um, that song became a thank you to Judy Van Zandt, who um, was and, and who is Ronnie Van Zandt's widow. Um, and why I say that is, if, if you know the story of how Shinedown was created, 
um, the estate was formed in Jacksonville, Florida. Even though I'm from Knoxville, Tennessee, the band was established in Jacksonville, Florida. And at that time, um, there was, our original guitar player was married to Melody Van Zandt, which is Ronnie's daughter. And so there was a connection with Skinner from the beginning. But I remember during that time being in Jacksonville, um, putting the band together and I was running out of money because I was signed to Atlantic. And there's a reason I'm bringing all this up because it's important. Um, I was signed to Atlantic with a different band from Knoxville for nine months. I was dropped. And then two weeks later, I got a phone call from Steve Robertson who said, I want to sign you to a development deal, which I didn't know what that meant. Right. It was uh, a deal that was basically created by the legendary Ahmed Erdogan. And the idea of it was you take a single artist and you develop that artist to either become solo or to become in a band, but that's the main thing, you develop them. Now it's a, it is a record contract, but it's not a guarantee that you will become a recording artist. And three years after I signed my second deal with Atlantic, which was the development deal, three years later, Shinedown was, was a real, it had become a real thing. And with a lot of work with a lot of people, and Judy being one of those people, because for about a year and a half, I did not have any money coming in. And I was working on demos with the band tirelessly, but I didn't have a place to go. I was probably going to have to go back to Tennessee. And she found me. Um, she used to own a club called the Freebird Live. She's since uh, sold it. But she said, what do you need in order to be able to just concentrate on the music? And I was like, Judy, I don't have any money. I don't even have a place to live. And she said, I'm going to let you stay at my house. I'm going to let you stay. She had a, a separate house on her property. Um, and she basically, she housed me rent free for a year and never asked me for anything. And I told her once uh, the album was coming out and we were going off to record, or we were going off, we had recorded, we were going off to tour. I looked at her and I said, I will pay you back one day. I don't know how I'm going to pay you back, but I'll pay you back. And lo and behold, about three and a half, four months into that first run of touring, we were at AAF in Boston. Mm, yes. Unfortunately, AAF is no longer. But yep. a, a legendary DJ named Mistress Carrie, um, we ended up playing that song live on air. Um, and one of the reasons was, is that we were actually playing Freebird Live about two weeks prior to that radio visit. And I had learned Simple Man with our former guitar player. And that was kind of the thank you to her because she was there and she thought it was very sweet. And, you know, moving on. Yeah. We did the song at the radio station and we left the radio station. They had recorded it. Now you gotta remember this is in 2003. So it's right at the beginning of like websites and MP3s and you know, putting things online. Not even, be pre MySpace probably too. Pre MySpace. Shit. And six weeks later we came back to Boston because we were on another tour with a bigger band. We came back to Boston six weeks later, played like we were playing like a 500 capacity or a, like a thousand seater or something like that as a headliner. And uh, they had made us aware that in six weeks that they had put that live version of us, of us singing Simple Man on their website and that it was approaching a million streams. And wow, we were kind of like, what, what is a stream? <laughs> right. You know what I mean? And yeah. so long story short, we went into Sanford, Florida. We cut the song, two takes just a vocal and a guitar. We stripped it on uh, Leave a Whisper. So we re-released the debut album with Simple Man on it almost a year later. And the rest is really history. And here's the thing. 
at the time, she had 50% of the publishing on all of the Skinner material. And obviously our version was everywhere. Radio picked it up immediately and it took off. I never ever asked like, you know, was that good enough? Did I pay you back enough? <laughs> Hey. <laughs> but it was kind of one of those things because she had 50%. It's very unique. I always still feel at times I can kind of feel Ronnie, you know, it's weird. I, it's weird and beautiful all at the same time. I always kind of feel like the back of, like, there's always kind of like a, kind of like a tap on my back. That's beautiful. Every night that I, that I sing that song. Him just letting me know, hey, good on you. Yeah, and, and as a Jewish man, that would be called a mitzvah, what, you, what you've done. To, to Judy and the, and the Van Zandt estate. So good on you for sure. But we, when I walked in there, man, like to, to record the song in Sanford, I go back to the moment. And this is the reason why I, I made, I brought that entire story into the question about, do we feel as if it's kind of become ours too? That you've adopted um, it, yeah. Yeah, I don't know if I could ever say that it's ours because it doesn't belong to us and it really doesn't belong to Leonard Skinner. It belongs to the people. Yeah. It belongs to the audience. Yeah. And all I'm trying to do and all we're trying to do is be as respectful as possible to the song. But I was terrified, terrified at that radio station at WAAF. Because what was happening was Mistress Carrie at the time, the DJ was asking all the bands that were coming in that week to like play a cover song. So we learned like some obscure STP song or something. <laughs> And we went into it like, and it was just a train wreck. So right. like 30 seconds into it, I was like, stop, stop, stop. This is terrible. <laughs> Live on the air. <laughs> and I'm like, we're, we're going to have to just play one of our songs or something like that. And then I'll never forget that Barry was in there and, you know, we had just played it for Judy a couple of nights prior. Wow. And we thought we'd never, ever play it ever again. Well, fun fact and for, for, for WAAF, that's also the radio station that uh, did, they, they released, Tesla released Signs, their yep. acoustic version from WAAF's performance. So right there. that's awesome that, that that happened to you as well. That's magic. But Barry looked at me and was like, do it, do it. And I'm like, do what? <laughs> and, and he's just like, just play Simple Man. I'm like, are you crazy? And the reason why I was so scared is because I, I, I was, there's, there's, there's three verses. And for the life of me, I could not remember the third verse in my brain. And, but I did it. Wow. And I did, re thank God, I, thank God I remember it. Like, and as we're getting to the third verse, I'm like, I don't have it. I don't have it. I don't have it. And then as soon as where I'm supposed to come in, I come in, it all came to me. Could that have been and Ronnie on the back shoulder maybe? Probably, man. But I had no inhibition. I had lost all inhibitions in regards to that because it was kind of out of body because yeah. I was so afraid that I was gonna mess it up. But I didn't sing it exactly like Ronnie. And that also finding out after it had been six weeks later and it had been you know, downloaded and streamed from their website, we went into Sanford. I cut the song in two takes, you know? And I just kind of, I just sang it the way I heard it. And uh, rest is history. That's beautiful. Well, we could talk all day. You've been off stage with DWP and our, and our brother, Brent Smith of Shinedown. We have reached the stage of this Q&A where what we call uh, the encore round. I'm going to do some nice. rapid fire questions at you. First thing that pops in your head, you got to answer. You know, if, if you want to email me after like, hey, man, sorry, I need to switch my answer. No, no, no. Let's do it. Let's, let's, right. let's, see, let's see what you throw at me. Here. All right. You ready, man? Yeah. All right. Favorite Motown singer ever? Otis Redding. Mm, that's a good one. What song, if you had the choice, could, would you go back and re-record? Whew. I Dare You, off the second album. So you, can you hear I Dare You, or you can't even listen to it right now, in a, the recording, in a way? No, I, mean, I, can, I can listen to it, yeah. Here's the thing about that song, why I say that is because it's a, the, the, the note in the chorus is a C. A C for a guy is really high. 
And, you know, we've, we've had to like tune it down. It's one of the reasons why we don't play it as much live, but when you're in front of the, the microphone and you've got the, this, once again, the excitement of just finishing a song and writing it and it's like, you know, I'm gonna sing it like this because it has so much power. And then the producer looks at you and is like, you sure you wanna sing it in that register? And then you drop it down in the studio and it just doesn't have the same like oomph to it. And you're like, it's forever. Let's record it. I probably would have tuned it down a half step. <laughs> you know, that's the only right. reason why. With that, what song would, it, are, are you 100% satisfied that you wouldn't touch a thing? Like, we did everything right on that song. Sound of Madness. That's, that's a great answer. Sound Even the little, there's, there's like weird little things in Sound of Madness. Again, if, if I can get anybody to, to after this Q&A, to go listen to Fly From The Inside and also Sound of Madness. Uh, I love kind of the, the, the you have a, a B lead track in your chorus on yeah. that, which is, uh, and I don't know if that was and super quick not to get off track, but was that from the get go or was that maybe a studio like, oh, let's add that. Here's what it was. So that album, The Sound of Madness, was mixed by the incredible, who's a really, really good friend of mine, uh, Chris Lord Algae. Oh, yeah. And, but... Sound of Madness, the song, is mixed by Doug McKean, who is the engineer of Sound of Madness. And Rob Cavallo's like the producer of that record and the producer of Amaryllis. And Doug is also the engineer of Amaryllis and Sound of Madness. And Doug also engineered the drums on the album Attention, Attention. Okay. And that was his baby from the very beginning of the recording process of the entire record. He chipped away at that song, like in the evenings in his spare time, because he was recording everything, you know, but like when the band wasn't in in the morning and then like three o'clock in the three o'clock in the morning sometimes too, like when he was done for the day and he had like a little bit of time just for himself, he would just slowly kind of be putting that song into a mix place where he heard it. So when it was time to do the mix of the, the album, and Chris was in there and he mixed the entire rest of the song and he mixed Sound of Madness also, but Doug's mix, man, it, you know, it was just one of those things where it was undeniable. And it's the only song on that record that's mixed by Doug, but I think that's one of the reasons why he was every day was refining that song and like every day, like kind of getting it. And it's just, if you listen to that song in headphones, whew, it's, I'm going there's to. There's something different on it. I I'm going to after this. Say. I swear. I hope everybody does too. All right, couple more. What song do you wish you could have written? Oh wow. What song do I wish I could yeah. have written? First thing that popped to your head. That is, man. That is so tough. Keep on rocking in the free world. Ooh, nice. But All I'm right. going to tell you why. Okay. It's not because the song as a whole. It's because of the second verse. Hmm. And the reason why is this. In my opinion, the most profound verse in any contemporary mainstream music song, in my opinion, is the second verse of Keep On Rockin' In The Free World. I'm gonna tell you why. Because he says, I see a woman in the night with a baby in her hand under an old street light near a garbage can. Now she's put her kid away and she's gone to get a hit. She hates her life and what she's done with it. And now there's one more kid that'll never go to school, never get to fall in love and never get to be cool. And I kind of get emotional even saying it right now. Yeah, um, wow. The depth of that. And the awareness of that is historically profound to me. And, you know, Bono, who some people will say he stole it from Dylan, but we'll say it came from Bono. He once said, all you need really is three chords in the truth. The truth. Yes, sir. Yeah. And I think that that verse is the ultimate definition of that. Oh, man. Brent, that's fantastic. Um, 
I don't think I want to ask any more. Um, that's, you blew me away, brother. Uh, and that, I'm, that <laughs> you're I very love, sweet. Yeah. Um, hey, if I haven't said it enough on this, just thank you for being you. Thank you for being up front during everything that's going on right now in this beautiful planet that we all, as individuals, as human beings, together, unified, all of us equal for our prosperity and our love for one another to rise above everything that we are all going through right now together. Thank you for being a champion in live entertainment and really being out front on a lot of these issues right now. We're always gonna be together on this because it's our responsibility to make sure that we return to the public and so that the public can be energized and feel safe and feel motivated by going to live shows and by us being able to do what it is we do. We are gonna get back to live music. We are gonna get back to being with each other. But I don't think everybody knows out there how important you and Danny have been at the very beginning of all of this, really assuring people that we are gonna do everything in our power to get back to being able to have big gatherings again. We're gonna do it the right way. We're gonna be educated, but we are going to get back to playing live music. And I just want to thank you for spearheading a lot of these conversations because it means a great deal, both you and Dan. Well, thanks, Brent. It takes a village. You know, we have, we have a team that just makes, you know, me, I, I fake it till I make it. So, you know, um, but, but we, we come, we're at the end of the day, we're fans. We are, and we believe in rock and roll. We believe in the spirit of it. You, you've talked about that. Rock and roll is more than just a music genre. It's, it's a way of life. It's a way of, the way of life. You don't find rock and roll. Rock and roll finds you. Yep. Um, I'm in this for the long haul. We're going to get out of this. We're going to get out of this darkness. You know, we, and we be stronger all, for it. I think so too, man. Um, you know, I was going to say if there's any last things you want to say to the fans out there, but I, I think you said it, unless there's, you know, one more, one more thing at, to give them some positive hope during this tough, tough year we fucking had. I just want everybody to know that, um, that we're with you because we're all equal and we're all together in this. That's something to always remember. We are in this together and we're gonna have to, we are gonna find the path to the other side. Um, hold on. I know it's tough, but we're gonna get our confidence back. We're going to listen to one another. We're going to be respectful of each other. And like I said a moment ago, we're going to be stronger because we've been handed something that is a defining moment in human history, not only for ourselves, but for the world that we live in to make it a better place, not only for ourselves, but for our children and our children's children and so on and so forth. Keep your head up no matter what. Don't, don't. Don't necessarily follow the negative comments. Find the optimism. Find the approach in the best way possible to not be a part of the problem, but to be a part of the solution and the discussion that creates the solution. Right on. Brent Smith, thank you for being with us. Thank My you for pleasure, the relationship. Man. Thank you. And we'll sign off and we'll, we'll see everybody out there sooner than later. Absolutely.